Hi, my name is Sean Cabinet and I'm a PhD student in the groups of David Scanlon at University College London and Aaron Walsh at Imperial College London. And our research uses computational modeling to understand the impacts of defects and disorder on solid state energy materials. So today I'm going to speak about our recent work looking at defect structure searching uh, and try to convey the important message that the standard modeling approach for defects is actually somewhat incomplete and can give qualitatively incorrect results in many cases. Okay, so what is the standard approach for modeling defects in solids? Well, we use the so-called supercell approach where we first start with our relaxed crystal structure for the host material. And then from this uh, primitive cell, we can create a supercell of the crystal large enough to avoid significant defect-defect interactions with neighboring supercells. Uh, with this supercell as our base, we can then go on to generate the different types of defects that we'd like to calculate. So for example, for a vacancy, we just remove one of these red atoms like this. And then uh, we allow this structure to relax using DFT or whatever other electronic structure method we want to use, giving us our final defect structure. And then with this final structure, we can calculate the formation energy, which in combination with the structure gives us all properties associated with the defect. So for example, the concentration, the transition level position, et cetera. So essentially from our final defect structure, we derive all properties associated with the defect. Okay, so what's wrong with this approach? I mean, it all seems relatively straightforward, right? Well, I'll tell a short story about when I was a fresh-faced first-year PhD student, and I started doing defect calculations in cadmium telluride. So I read the papers, I followed this workflow, and I had my nice set of defect results, which I was pretty happy with. Uh, and I then went on and kind of read some other older defect theory papers that had looked at cadmium telluride. And initially, I was quite happy. Um, my results agreed with previous studies, which found these two um, shallow levels near the VBM for cadmium vacancies. Then I read some papers by Lani and Zunger from the early 2000s, where they found these metal-metal dimer reconstructions at vacancies in chemically similar materials. And I began to wonder whether this was possible in my system. So I tried manually moving these two atoms closer together like this before then relaxing and, oh wow, that gives me a lower energy defect structure. Hmm. So then I went and looked at some of the other defects I'd calculated that had some kind of chemical similarities. And, you know, I was like, oh, you guys are cool, right? You wouldn't trick me like that. But let's just kind of move a few atoms around like this and see what happens. And oh, wow, they're lower energy too. What's going on here? So as a defects guy, this is where my reality is starting to come crashing down around me. Looking at my transition level diagram, uh, we can see that this dimer formation completely changes this picture from having two shallow levels near the VBM for cadmium vacancies to now having a single deep negative U level much closer towards the middle of the band gap uh, and also qualitatively alters the recombination behavior of this material of this defect as well. As I'll show later, in many cases, the changes in behavior are actually far more drastic than this. So the problem I'm talking about, of course, is that when we generate our initial defect structure in this way, um, there's actually no guarantee that uh, this will give us the true ground state defect structure. And this is the workflow, you know, this gradient optimization that is followed by essentially all ab initio defect studies. For example, this ideal undistorted defect structure could actually lie much closer to a local minimum on the potential energy surface, as was the case here, which would then give us a higher energy metastable structure, which does not reflect the true defect behavior. So a question we might first ask about this is, well, how prevalent is this behavior? So we tested this by applying our defect structure searching method uh, across a wide and diverse range of materials and their defects. In doing so, we found this behavior to occur in every material that we looked at, where you find these energy lowering reconstructions that are missed by the standard modeling approach I just described, uh, with, with a variety of underlying physical driving factors as shown here. The next question you might ask is, well, how important can this behavior be? Well, if we remind ourselves that essentially all properties associated with the defect are derived from the defect structure, we can see that an inaccurate defect structure will give an inaccurate formation energy and thus inaccurate derived properties. For example, this diagram here shows how even relatively minor changes in the formation energy can lead to pretty significant changes in the defect level position within the band gap and thus on the predicted doping and recombination behavior. 
One quite severe example, which had not been previously realized in the literature, is that of the vacancies in antimony sulfide and antimony selenide. So here our method reveals strong antimony-antimony and selenium-selenium dimer and trimer bonding, which drastically lowers the defect energies and makes them much more important defects in the system, uh, as well as revealing rare four electron negative U behavior and thus ultra strong self-compensation. Um, and so I'd encourage you to check out this preprint here um, if you're interested in that. So listed here are some further examples from the literature where this behavior has been noted, either serendipitously or through manual searching, um, and found to be crucial for defect behavior. Again, just kind of demonstrating the importance and the prevalence of this behavior for defects in solids. Okay, so now we've established the importance and prevalence of this behavior, what can we use to combat it? Well, there have been a handful of strategies proposed in the literature, um, and unfortunately, while I don't have time to go into the details here, uh, beyond saying that their efficiency or inefficiency in terms of computational cost and manual implementation renders them infeasible for typical defect studies, where we look at a range of um, defects at once. So with that in mind, we had the goal of developing a method that was both accurate and efficient in navigating the defect configurational landscape and identifying the ground state structure. So I had the idea to leverage the localized molecule in a solid type behavior of point defects where the dominant interactions are those with the nearest and next nearest neighbors, as well as the fact that defect reconstructions are typically driven by the need to accommodate the excess charge introduced by that defect species. So for example, the fully ionized charge state of cadmium vacancies is minus two, where we have no excess charge or no change in valence electron count. In the neutral state, however, we now have two excess holes present. And so this uh, will often lead to a reconstruction involving movement of two of the defect neighbor atoms. Uh, in this case, two of the tellurium atoms coming closer together and forming this strong dimer bond, as we saw earlier. So in our method, Right. In our method, we apply a range of distortions to the defect neighbor atoms using this value of the excess charge to dictate the number of bonds to distort, um, which isn't always perfect, but typically gives us a good starting point and puts us close enough to the minimum that a gradient optimization will find it uh, if present. And we've tested this choice across a range of cases with this data provided in the SI of our paper. So with this mesh of trial distorted structures, we then rattle them, meaning we add some small random displacements to the atom uh, positions, which break symmetry and helps to disrupt the long range lattice potential, which can aid in the location of the global minimum by our gradient optimization. So we then allow these structures to relax at a reliable level of theory by using cheap coarse numerical parameters, which allows the calculations to run fast while retaining sufficient qualitative accuracy uh, to identify distinct defect structures. Finally, we plot the energies versus distortion, and we see that our defect ground state is obtained for a certain distortion range corresponding to these points on the potential energy surface. So in summary, the strategy here is to use a coarse exploration of the defect configura configurational landscape and identify the ground state structure before continuing with our final converged energy calculations with this correct structure. We found their method to be extremely successful in identifying structural reconstruction to defect, um, a defect reproducing all known cases of this behavior in our benchmark data set. By applying it to a wide and diverse range of materials and their defects, we revealed the widespread prevalence of this behavior for defects in solids, uh, as well as the underlying physical driving factors and identifying many cases which had not been previously realized. As a brief sneak preview, I'll mention our recent collaboration with Professor Yu Kumagai in Japan, applying shake and break in a high throughput search for symmetry breaking at oxygen vacancies in several hundred oxides. So here our method identifies energy long reconstructions in over 50% of cases. And we note that this tends to be particularly likely um, when you have either multinary composition, reduced crystal symmetry, or mixed uh, ionic covalent bonding, all of which contribute to greater complexity on the potential energy surface. So to wrap up, I have to give a huge acknowledgement to my colleague, Araya Mascara Luis, uh, as it was only through supervising her master's project that we got to test this idea out. A big thanks, as always, to my mentors, David Scanlon and Aaron Walsh, and also our rapidly growing Shake and Break user base. So with that, I'll leave you with the key takeaways, and thank you very much for your attention.